everyone. Welcome to our AppliChat webinar for today. I'm Patrick Teeley from AppliChat Healthcare. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. And today uh, we are hosting a webinar on data-driven talent acquisition and the metrics that matter in healthcare recruitment. Uh, at AppliChat Health Healthcare, we host webinars one to two times a month, typically on topics related to nurse recruitment and healthcare recruitment and HR topics more generally. Also at AppliChat, we help healthcare organizations in the US and Canada to find more nurses for permanent hires. Our specialty is sourcing passive nurse candidates from outside of the job boards. So we're able to bring a bigger audience of nurses to our clients' vacancies. We also screen and engage with every applicant to make sure they're a good fit for our healthcare clients. So to find out more about what we do at AppliChat and to access our free resources, please check out my online business card. We will put that link in a chat in the chat here right away. And on that website, you can do the following. You can view all of our past webinars on nurse recruitment and sign up for our future free online events. You can join our Nurse Recruitment Secrets Facebook group to share and learn more about nurse recruitment. You can subscribe to our Nurse Recruitment Secrets newsletter as well. And you can also find there my LinkedIn profile. Uh, so please message me there on LinkedIn or here in the webinar chat, and I can tell you more about AppliChat and, and we can speak, we can follow up later as well. So now moving on to today's webinar, as I mentioned, we're going to discuss the metrics that matter in healthcare recruitment. Our speakers will discuss how you can use data to improve talent engagement and make more hires, increase accountability for recruiters and sources, make better decisions, and identify how to allocate capital and time and more. So on that note, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Uh, Adam Chambers is the president and founder of AppliChat Healthcare, and he'll be leading the discussion today. Hey, Adam. Hello. Hello. Good to see you again. And our guest today is Matthew Craven. Matt is based in Portland, Oregon, where he is the talent sourcing, talent acquisition sourcing manager with Peace Health. This is Matt's third appearance on an Apple Chat webinar. We really appreciate Matt you coming and joining us and sharing your time and your wisdom once again. Uh, and I'll, I will say that your last webinar, I think, is still our most viewed webinar ever. So no pressure. Uh -huh for today yeah <laughs> no pressure okay yeah. I'll, I'll try to do a, a special dance to get more people how's that right, All right. On. Well, that sounds good Welcome hey, I, back. I, thank you thank you for having me um i enjoy being here and having having conversations about talent acquisition and so i appreciate you having me here for a third time so hopefully awesome. people get get some good good information out of this today we're getting a great response already so i think All it'll right. be interesting now, just one more note from me for today's audience. Uh, we love it when our webinars are interactive, so please post your questions or comments in the chat anytime during the session, and we'll try and get to them uh, when we can. And um, so on that note, thanks to everyone for joining us today, and I'll just turn it over to Adam to start the discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you everybody for joining. So the reason that we're doing this webinar today is because we know Matt and we've had some conversations with him and about a month ago, he shared with me a survey. And in the survey, 56% of talent acquisition teams said they had very little or no influence on how their performance is measured. Today, Matt's gonna talk about that, and what you can do about that. And ultimately the, the goal of this session is to uplift everybody in how they can use and implement data to not only get a better performance from their team, but also understand why the team is performing like it is and being able to identify and share with leadership what's going on in the market and what is in, within your control and what is not within your control. So I'm going to be asking questions kind of as a curious student here. Matt's going to lead and share as he's the expert. And I'll be chipping in to kind of clarify things for myself because this is something that I want to improve as well. So Matt's going to share a presentation and we'll jump into it. All right, perfect. Well, um, Adam, thanks for, again, thanks for having me here today. Um, and um, as, as I shared with you and Patrick in the past that um, data is really important to me. And so uh, I really do think that the more we in talent acquisition can use data, 
the better stories we can tell. And so um, I, I put together a couple slides, nothing really elaborate, but really just to kind of keep some some of the topics online, what I think is important that we would want to talk. So jump in and ask questions on that. I don't know, are you seeing my screen right now? Because it doesn't show that it's sharing. Um, I'm going to add it to the stream. Uh, yes, I can see it now. Okay, you can say it now, perfect. So data drives decisions. I mean, it, 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 it does in every industry, whether it's recruiting, sales, um, business analytics, or whatever it is, even when you're developing new technologies, data drives decision. And, you know, for so many years, um, when you think about recruiting and you think about um, talent acquisition in general and, and overall, no, no specific company, no uh, specific industry is that, um, a lot of recruiters over the years, um, when when asked how they're doing and or what they're doing, there there's a lot of doing the best we can. There's a lot of um, responses that don't really um, amount to data that can, that you can share. And so with that, you know, one of the things that I I mean that I'm not going to say I take credit for this because a lot of organization do does this. I mean, we do it in Peace Health, and we did it before I joined Peace Health, and and in other organizations I've worked in, but. What what data really does is it helps tell the story. And so what I'd like to do today is just talk about a few things. And you touched upon um, reporting and data regarding um, recruiters and what impacts uh, how they're the, how it's impacted from a survey that I did in 2020. So if you want, I'm going to start there and just kind of yeah. give you a little bit of context on that, and then and then kind of work backwards here. So. Give me a, we'll go back. Here we go. We'll talk a little bit about this. Back in 2021, um, I did some, I wanted to do some, gather some information about um, reporting and what recruiters and TA leaders were looking at uh, from reporting in the sense of how they feel, what's the most important things that needed to be reported for them. And I got about 142 people responding. And these are all from unique organizations and various different industries. So it wasn't like 30 people from one organization given the same answers. This came from 142 different organizations. And what I did was ask them um, some different questions and had like 20 different options of what kind of data should we be reporting as recruiters, as a talent acquisition, and how do we rate our performance? And before we get to that, one of the things that, that we found out was is that a lot of recruiters and a lot of um, TA leaders really don't feel that they have control over what we should be reporting. And when I say that, I don't mean we can always put the report together and show the information that we want to share, but some leaders and organizations don't, they, they have ideas of success that are different than what we do. I mean, you no know, time to hire, as, as you can see here, um, that's normally one of the top five indicators that most organizations use to determine success. But is that a fair assessment to use from reporting? Because as we all know, I'm sure there's a lot of recruiters on this um, webinar right now that will, will agree that if I find a candidate today, one day after the requisition gets filled, I submit them tomorrow and it sits on the manager's desk for 45 days and then they go through the hiring process and get someone hired and it takes 75 days to get hired. Is that the recruiter's fault that, that that person didn't get hired within a two week period of time? Maybe some of it, maybe they should have pushed a little harder, but we also know that managers sometimes don't move very quickly, but then the recruiter gets gets rated on their performance based on that time to hire. It took 75 days to build a position, but the recruiter actually submitted that candidate within two days of the requisition getting open. So in that right there, when you think about some of the top performance indicators that are out there that are currently being used. Time to hire, source of hire. And when you talk about source of hire, they're talking a little bit about where do the candidates come from? I mean, are they coming from direct sourcing? Are they coming from advertising? And they're using that as a measure for performance um, for the TA department and potentially individual recruiters. Um, they also listed um, there as quality candidates submitted in this, um, which um, if you look at the second list is what preferred is actually the number one indicator there. And what that means is, are we submitting good people or are we just submitting anybody that applies to the position? Um, and so it's really important. Um, it, what, what, what we found in the survey is a lot of people were saying that this was an indicator, but it wasn't one of the top ones. And then hiring manager experience, um, you know, again, that is something that um, that is currently being used, 
but um, is it is it important? I believe it is, and it was also on the list of the preferred list as well. And then diversity. So when you when you look at this, and if you look at this, um, the the top two right there, source of hire and time to hire, those are always, those are things that we in recruiting can influence a little bit, but we don't have total influence on that. But what we do have influence on is the quality of candidates that we submit. We know the positions that we recruit. And if we're submitting candidates to the managers and um, they're rejecting them, then that means that we're not doing our job as a recruiter. Now, we do know that managers, some managers may be rejecting qualified people because of some um, for some reason. But in general, when you have a candidate that is 100 percent qualified, that they're going to be accepted by the manager. And so one of the things that we do in sourcing here at Peace Health is we really focus on quality of candidates submitted. And I will tell you that our submittal rate for sourcing here is right around 90 to 95 percent in a given month right there. Um, and we set that standard high because we don't want to waste any of the manager's time with candidates that are subpar. So if you think about that from a recruiting standpoint, if we are able to do that high level that shows that uh, we're doing our job and getting people that are quality to the managers so that they can actually make hires, not just have to go through a bunch of different candidates. Now, candidate experience is another one. We want to make sure candidates have good experience. We are the ambassador of an organization, the recruiter is, it, and the sourcer is. So if we're giving them that top-notch world-class experience, they're going to be more engaged to want to be a part of this organization because we know in this market right now that it's hard to um, attract talent because people are, and I think I have a chart in one of the slides here, people, it's getting harder and harder to get people to change jobs right now. And if you can give them that top-notch experience, then you're going to be able to influence more candidates to be able to change jobs. Now, how do you measure that? Um, in one of my organizations I worked with in the past, we actually measured um, the results of um, how the, the the experience that each candidate had when they went through the process so that we, we can really see what we were doing right, what we were doing wrong, and how we can improve on those things as well right there. Can I ask, so why is this the case? Why are TA teams being measured on data points that are not actually related to the results they're trying to achieve? You know, I, th I think a lot of it is, is recruiting and sourcing has evolved over the last 25 years. I've been in, in, the, in the TA profession for 25 years. And I think when you look in the early, early aspects of recruiting, the one easiest measure to be able to measure recruiter performance is how many hires you got each month or each year and how quickly you were able to do that. And so we know that number of hires is not necessarily an indicator of performance because um, you, Adam, could have really hard positions to fill and I could have really easy positions to fill and I could fill 40 positions and you can fill 10. And so is that an indicator of performance right there? And I think on the other side of that, the time to hire, that was an easy way at early on to measure because when the requisition opened and when the person accepted an opportunity, you could measure that. But there's a lot of variables in there that really impact that. But I think it was used because it was an easy measure that is in almost every ATS that you can pull that data and be able to really capture how quickly you're filling those positions. Now, as ATSs are getting more complex and having more data at each data point in each pro spot in the process, we are now able to measure more things. We can actually, in a lot of ATSs, you can measure the time it takes to submit. So the requisition opens up and I submit somebody within five days, then I can show that, you know, I was, a, I mean, a recruiter can now show that they submitted a candidate within the first five days of the requisition being open. Now we did our job. And, and then if we add another layer to that, we're able to measure the quality of candidate, the acceptance rates of all the cans that we are submitting is at 90%, meaning that not only are we sending them to the managers quickly, we're also um, sending quality people that they would want to talk to. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the new technology is 
opened up a new realm of data and yeah. teams just need to start talking about that more with leadership and the people they report to. Right. I think so. I mean, I think I mean, more so than anything is it goes back to the, the um, not uh, very few people feel that they can, the TA feels that they can control the metrics that we want to, uh, that are, that we're being measured against. And I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of history. Uh, you know, we've done things a, a certain way for a very, very long time and change. And we know change management is a process. It's a process of, sharing why new processes or new reporting would be more beneficial to really show the the the, the effectiveness of talent acquisition and the effectiveness of a recruiter versus some of the old old ways that maybe really didn't d show anything other than hey it took a long time to fill a position but who was at M who was the um, reason behind that there now with technologies um, I know a lot of the tools whether it's ISOMs, Taleo, Greenhouse, a lot of them now measure every step of the process. They measure from the time that the applicant comes in to the time they get presented, from the time that they interview from the manager. So you can measure each step and see where the, the lag is or where it's slowing down and where it's moving fast. And so then you can you can measure that and report that out. So for an example, you know, if if you have a time to hire of 75 days. And the leaders are really hung up on that. If your ATS is set up correctly, you can say, well, it only took 18 days to get all the candidates submitted. And it took, I'm not really good at math here on the fly here, 37 days um, to get that candidate from the manager's hands to make an offer. Mm -hmm. So what we may need to look at is our processes to bring more efficiencies to get those candidates to the manager's process a little bit quicker. And that may mean reducing the number of people that they have to speak to, um, and also maybe helping them get the candidate scheduled. A lot of managers want to schedule their own interviews. If we can help with that, then that can reduce that amount of time as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of links in the chain that can be looked up. Do you have this survey? Are we able to share this with people? Yeah, I mean, I have it in a PDF file, so I could definitely, um, Adam, if you want, um, I know that this get the this pre this webinar will get um, posted on LinkedIn afterwards. I can yeah. add it into the chat of that if you want, or I can send it to you and you can share it out as well. What yeah, do you just, prefer? Um, if you're watching, type survey in the chat or in the comments, and then we'll send Matt's survey to you. So, yeah, I know we jumped to, jumped to the end because I kind of introduced this point, but yeah. uh, it'd be great to go back to see that. The chart yeah, let me let me do that real quick here. So let's go back to the beginning here, and one of the things that you know data drives decisions, and it makes helps us make better decisions as well um, when we're putting strategies together as a TA department, whether it's recruiters or sourcers or. Um, even um, from a TA marketing standpoint, the more data you have, the, the better decisions you can make so that you can get the outcomes you need, and that is hires. And as I mentioned, alluded to at the very beginning, in the past, a lot of people, a lot of recruiters, even a lot of TA departments will say, hey, I'm doing the best I can. And we're doing the best we can. But you know that doesn't that that doesn't give a whole lot of good feels from um, from the hiring leaders and executives because they want to know exactly what we're doing, and so you know what we've done. I mean, even at Peace Health, what we've done here is really put together, um, for lack of better words, a shut up deck of everything that we're doing and the market, the data behind it, so that way they can see all the avenues that we're taking. We can show the data that's supporting it and why we're doing it, so that way their support from our stakeholders of what we're doing. But it also helps tell the stories of why we're not getting to a certain place as well. Data can be used, and, and some people will use data to make excuses. Um, I, I'm really careful with that because I don't want to share data. It's not necessarily to make an excuse of why we're not filling a position. It's really to make, make our, it's allowing to show our stakeholders what the market looks like. And then as we um, put that information out there, then we can go ahead and say, these are the strategies we're taking to combat that and overcome that so that we can really put targeted efforts 
in finding candidates that we need that are going to be more likely to even be engaged with us, our brand, and our opportunities that we have in our organization. Mm-hmm. And so with that, you know, um, you know, we 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 use a lot of, of information here. And I know I said, where do you get that data? You can get that data from a, a lot of different places. You can get it from your hiring history. You know, one of the things that comes up a lot of times in, in an organization is if you're in a big, if you're in a smaller city, they'll say, you know what, we need to do more recruiting outside of our geographic areas. But if you can show the data, here's the thing that you can do is you can show the data that says, you know what, 85% of all of our hires come locally. So would we want to put more effort externally in all those other markets? Maybe we would, but just note that 85% of our hires are coming locally. So we need to make sure that our brand locally is strong and use that data. And I'll show an example of that in a bit here. Um, But you, you want to be able to show why we want to make sure we're putting a focus on local, but then start looking at where the hires came from outside of our markets and use that information so that we can say, we're going to put some strategies in place based on successes that we've had in other areas. Maybe you're in Topeka, Kansas, and you're like, I need to get some people to move to Topeka, Kansas. But it shows from hiring in the last two years that we've gotten people from um, Dallas, Texas or South Dakota And we have information that shows that because we have hires that show on their resume, that's where they came from. Now we use that data to start targeting the areas where we're seeing the greatest number of hires that we've had in the past to build some future opportunities from there as well. And one of the things that you can do with that is, you know, we all have employee referral bonus, uh, employee referral programs. And one of the things that you can do in that is take a human approach to that. If you know that you hired 15 people in um, Dallas, Texas in the last two years for this key role, instead of just sending a flyer to those 15 people, maybe reach out to them and use the data from them about what would, what what enticed you to move to uh, Topeka, Kansas? What was, what were the motivating factors for you? What is um, some things that we can use that from the market that will entice people? And then on the other side of that, use them as, hey, do you know people in Dallas that might be interested as well? So you use that market internal data, the hiring history to build a new strategy to bring more more talent from the markets that you've already had success in in the past right there. And mm-hmm. you can use that also with competitors as well. I would, I'd like to ask, so we do these educational webinars maybe a couple of times a month. Um, we've done them for the past year. And we get great feedback for them, but often I think as this happens with me as well, you hear a new idea, you think it's great. And then the weekend goes by or a couple of days goes by and you forget about it and you just go back into the day to day on the job tasks that are kind of clogging your inbox. Mm-hmm. So to, to enact this kind of change, like who would need to be responsible for it? Um, how could people fit it into a tight schedule? So, you know, um, what I what I will say is if you have a good data analytics team in your organization and they can pull this data and, and support you in this, then that's a great way to be able to do that. Um, sometimes it, it comes down to the TA leader that has to do this because um, the TA leader knows how they want to slice and dice the data so that they can get the information that they want and they can get it for themselves faster if they have the raw data. Uh, some sourcers, I mean, it depends on the passion that they have. Um, I mean, we're all busy, I know that. And so when I say if you have passion, you may say I have passion, but I don't have time. Um, and I get that, and I get that. But if you have the passion, you know, one of the things that you you can do is look at your day and say, if I slow down, and, and I use this a, a lot, sometimes we all wanna move at the speed of light and try to get things done as quickly as we can. And the output and the outcomes of that aren't necessarily what we are desired, but we're moving so fast to try to make stuff, make activity. But instead, maybe sometimes we need to just pause for a minute. And some of the stuff that I put together, and I'll share like just screenshots of it in a moment here, some of the stuff only took me 30 minutes. And so if you think about, if you start your day in the morning and you block out some time, um, maybe on a, Thursday morning at eight o'clock when you start 
to do a little bit of research and put this together and start putting a strategy together, you'll find that it won't really take that much time. And I'd encourage you to do it because one of the things that this does is it also helps you be a better storyteller to your stakeholders. You can share this information with them so that they have something in hands of what you're physically going to be able to do. It will reduce the amount of ad hoc meetings that you have with your leaders because you have now taken, taken this um, by the, you, you grab this by, I'm trying to think of the word, the acronym here, sorry, or the, the word, but you're, you're, you're handling it. <laughs> and what you're doing, you're being proactive and sharing data. So that way um, it's going to, re, they, they understand what you're doing. And then if you say, hey, you know what, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, I'm going to update you on all the data points and what we're doing. And they're going to say, oh, great. I'm not going to call you every other day asking you what you're doing because you've, you've laid out your strategy. You have laid out your approach and you're keeping me updated on a weekly basis of what the results are. Uh, I'm good. And so when you think about time, if you can do mm -hmm. something, if you can slow down a bit and you can start putting some of your strategies together and then you share it with your stakeholders, what you're going to find is you're going to have a little bit more free time because you're going to have stakeholders not reaching out to you every other day and needing to talk to you for an hour every day uh, about what are you doing to fill your position. You have something now that you can share on a regular basis there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think we do measure our success by how many ticks we put on the to-do list, um, how many things we get out of our inbox. And maybe that's a, a culture thing within an organization. Kind of mm -hmm. relates back to the survey where time to hire was number one. So. Right. I think it's important what you yeah. said to, to step back and think what I'm actually trying to do here and achieve. Right. Um, can we go on to the uh, the next point that I find really oh. fascinating? Yeah, definitely. I didn't know if you want to show the, the charts or not. Do you want to do that real quick? Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah Let's do that. Yeah. So what I did was just show some of the market intelligence so you can get some examples here. This came from one of the a tool out there. Um, a, a search tool that has data analytics. And this just shows the trend line of um, people changing jobs over the last three years for registered nurses nationwide. And as you can see, 2020 and 2021, it was pretty flat. And there was an increase each year at the end of the year for people looking for new jobs. 2022 shows a trend that um, nurses are not changing jobs as frequently and actually they're doing it less. So we're going in the op opposite direction. And again, this is not used to be for an excuse when we share with our stakeholders, this is just to show, hey, this is why it is ha we're having a challenge. But we have some uh, we have some approaches that we're taking um, in order to um, combat that right here. But this is good information because if they're saying, hey, we're seeing a slowdown in applicants, well, we can say, hey, you know what, nationwide, everybody is because of because maybe the economy is affecting people's willing to change jobs right now. Are you able uh, to share the source of that? Because I think that's going to be yeah. This, like this came, anyone on this will find that yeah. useful to share. Yeah, this one came. This this actually came from Hire Easy. Okay. They have a they have an analytic tool that you can use to be able to share that with. Okay. The next one here, I was trying to click the wrong screen here. This right here is coming from Hire Data. This shows where everybody was hired in the last two years, and then you can use this to start looking at where the highest concentration of people were hired. Obviously, we're on the West Coast, so that's where the majority of the people got hired. But now you can start utilizing this and start pinpointing where are our success, success um, locations where we need to maybe put some targeted, targeted efforts in recruiting and sourcing. And then, you know, this is just national information. This is just information about LPNs. The, and we got, I got this information actually from a, the Oregon Board of Registered Nursing. This came off of their site. They were able to share this information, and it, it, this report is actually published every December. So this is not even information. This is free information. You just go onto the Board of Registered Nursing site, and you'll be able to pull this information. And guess what? I've checked. Most states have this. So if you are in a different state, go on the BRN, and you'll be able to get information. You'll even be able to find information about um about graduations um, for nurses and so on and such like that. So look for free information that you can use to get market intelligence that you'll be able to use to build your strategies as well. And then the, the 
I just want to kind of share here, you know, document all your efforts. When when you're doing everything that you're doing here, talk about document all your outreach, where you're outreaching. And what that means is when you build your list, I think I've shown this in other presentations here. I have a funnel. How many people am I out, um, reaching out to? How many people are responding? How many people are getting interviewed? How many people are getting hired? And what this does is it shows all your efforts and the outcomes that are coming from this. And one of the, the great things about this that came from a, a stakeholder earlier, I say late last year, was they're like, wow, you do a lot of effort to get a little bit of results from from that and to just get a little bit of results and i said yes the market is that tight where we have to send out this many messages to basically squeeze out 10 hires and so if they see that then they know the amount of effort it takes to get those is significant and there's an appreciation for that as well again we're not making excuses we're just telling a story so we can share the successes that we're having from that but also the challenges that come with that as well Mm -hmm. Okay, and I know you want to talk a little bit about organizing data. So I'll, uh, you want me to, um, how do you want me to kind of share that for you, yeah, Adam? I mean, I... um, so yeah, I see like we've had a couple of comments in the chat about that as well. Would you have any examples you could share of like template? You know what? I don't have or... one readily available here but what i can say I, I guess maybe i can ask this question adam and maybe you can get some people to to raise their hands i um because i don't see the chat um so one of the things that i will will say is um pivot tables are something that i learned how to use about seven years ago i was doing a lot of manual work on excel and it was really wasting a lot of my time um, and what pivot tables do if you don't, if you've not used them, and maybe let me ask this question. How many people know what pivot tables are in Excel? And while you're getting the responses on that, Adam, what pivot tables do is they actually um, help you take a, a large a sum of raw data and then be able to slice and dice it into smaller consumable um, data points. And what this does, I mean, and, and it allows you to be able to see key, key points that you want to use to make decisions on your sourcing strategy, your recruiting strategy, and even the outcomes of those efforts as well. It allows you to drill down. So, for example, one of the things that you can do here in a pivot table is you can say, you know what, I have all the hires in an Excel spreadsheet that lists their names. Where they, where they originally were living, the position they were hired into, and maybe the location that they're getting in, they're getting hired into. So now you have all this raw data. And mm -hmm. instead of just like filtering them out and then copying and pasting and then, and then manually counting, you can go in there and create a pivot table, which will allow you to be able to break down, okay, here are all the registered nurses that were hired in Oregon. These were all the registered nurses that were hired in Washington and they're in chunks and pieces. So it's consumable, but then you can also create a dashboard that will show and represent um, what all your efforts are doing so that you don't have to manual plug in information to get the, um, to get the, um, the totals of everything that you're doing here. It does it all for you. So it is very easy to uh, put together I actually have created on um, YouTube, um, Adam, I have three training sessions on how to create um, pivot table just so that people can um, learn how to really slice and dice that information. They're a little long. I need to shorten them up a little bit, but they're both, all three of them are about 11 to 12 minutes long. And it'll walk you through how to create dashboards. It'll allow you to teach, it'll teach you how to um, create um, data points that will help you be able to build strategies and it'll also be able to report all the efforts that you've done as well. Okay, I will send that out to everyone okay. who signed up to this. So uh, we'll include that in the message. I'm gonna share actually an example that we have. That's okay. very basic. Perfect. And show people how the sheet should be laid out in order to achieve the the data management you want. So Matt, jump in if you have any improvements on this, but okay. what we, we have done with our clients is we have 
the main spreadsheet that has each submission to a client. So their name would go in here, the candidate column, the date would go in here, the position, the specialty. So each column has a data point that we want to present. So you can see here, say candidate two is currently interviewing, um, but the client said they will not be pursued. So then we would go in and mark that as uh, rejected. So you can see here that we put that data on the home sheet and then as Matt has been referencing, the pivot table comes on the next sheet. So what we have here is something that can lay out the statuses. So we've got the, here, the statuses that are in use. If you come over to here, we've got submitted, interviewing, offer accepted, candle with, with tree. And then the table will show what our count is for each status. And it is something that you need to learn to set up. So that's why we'll send the recordings. But we find being able to show clients this definitely tells a more in-depth story and provides them much more value than if we're simply showing them this and asking them how it was last week. Yeah, it removes the gray area and makes it much more fact-led. So that's a very basic uh, yeah. stripped back example there. And I was going to say, Adam, I, I, if you, I mean, this obviously only had four records in there. And when you have like 250 records on this and let's just say you're a sourcer um, and you, you've you submitted 15 people or 100 people mm -hmm. and you want to be able to know, you, you're tracking in the notes, what stage they are in the process. You can create a pivot table so that just like you did there to show the stage of every candidate. So that way, when you know in that stage, that either there's ones that you have to follow up, maybe there's one that's a follow-up one, you can utilize this to be able to focus on what you need to follow up on. But on top of it, it's a good way to be able to show your effort. And we do this for our sourcing team here. We take all the data that we have to build that funnel to be able to put in the pivot table so that way we can really show all our efforts and what the outcomes equal out to that right there as well. And, you know, Adam, whether it's on this platform or anything, I'd be more than willing to do a, a live presentation, a live demonstration on how to build a pivot table. That takes about 15, 20 minutes. If anybody's interested, Adam, feel free to, to let have them chat or message me directly. Um, because I think data is so important. And so many people don't know how to use Excel to its fullest capacity. And mm -hmm. we a lot of people will say, recruiters, we don't need to know that stuff. And I challenge you because I think the more we have data in our hands as individual contributors, as recruiters, more we have data in our hands as leaders, the more we are able to share that to our stakeholders, the more credibility we have and the more influence we have to be able to change what we're doing, but also more so maybe even change what we should be measuring and being, um, being, uh, evaluated on as a as a talent acquisition team as a whole because time to hire i mean i'm sure everybody i, I i'm sure that most everybody on this call here has probably said that their number one metric is how many positions they fill and time to hire and that's not uncommon and we need to change that because there's a lot of things that we influence uh, every single day and if we can really move away from that and be able to report on those things i think it's going to show more value add um, and then we use that market intelligence to be able to show our efforts that we're taking and what we're doing. We're really starting to become more consultative versus um, order takers. And I think that's what everybody on this call right here probably wants to be more consultative and be more effective as a consultant in your organization than being just an order taker. Mm. Yeah, I, I can see we've got some interest on that. So okay, um, you got the names of the people there and we can maybe set something up in the future. Okay, perfect. Because um, I've so much value from what you're saying and the, the consultative approach, I think, is what will help people get through the recession. If yeah. They, I know there's Definitely. murmurings. Is it here? Is it, this, is it not here? But uh, that like learning skills like what Matt has shared today will really help you uh, survive and be more relaxed about it because yeah. you know that you're presenting the facts. 
Yep. And that and that's the big piece of it is stating facts. Um, and data does that. Um, and it tells stories. Uh, and it supports everything that you do. Um, if you're saying that I am sourcing in Las Vegas for registered nurses, the leader is going to say, why are you doing that? Why, mm -hmm. why are you spending your time there? We can say, well, you know what? In the last two years, we've hired 47 nurses from there. And we've talked to some of the nurses. And here's some of the reasons why they're saying this, that we should be focusing on this. And so we're going to we're gonna put some effort there. And we're, we're seeing some success. And then you can show from your pipeline that you built what kind of success that you've had right there over time and be able to report on that. So data, like I said, data drives decisions. And... It's something that TA has gotten better to do over the last five or six years, but I think there's so much more opportunity for us to be able to get even better and get more advanced in what we're trying to share to our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I think we'll leave it there. But thank okay. you so much, Matt, for for coming on today. I'm going to bring you. Patrick back in as well if you'd like to add anything. And I'll also put your LinkedIn link in the, the chat, Matt, so that if anyone wants to reach out, they can do so. But thank you so much. I've, I've learned a lot and I will be taking action. Hey. That's great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Adam. Thank you for having me, Adam. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, guys. That's awesome. So Matt's uh, LinkedIn is in the chat. You can connect with him there. I'm also putting my um, link in the chat again, my online business card. So please head over there to find all of our nurse recruitment, uh, resources, free resources, and also connect with me there. I also want to share about something new that we're starting up. We've had a lot of uh, interest from leaders in healthcare recruitment asking for ways to connect and uh, find each other. And so we're launching a healthcare recruitment leaders exchange that we're going to invite um, folks that are generally director level and up. Uh, if you're interested in participating in that, we'll probably be meeting about once every month. Uh, we'll have the first session. We're going to announce that fairly soon. So please uh, connect with me again in LinkedIn, and we will uh, connect you up with that. I'll send you the link so that you can join. If you're not a, a director level or higher, contact me as well if you're interested, in, because uh, if we have interest from another group, we might uh, be able to do something to meet your needs as well. So thanks very much to uh, Matt and Adam for joining today and for leading that uh, presentation lots of good information lots of good information from our viewers uh, in the audience and uh, we look forward to the what will come out of that and i know there's going to be material shared and i think uh yeah hopefully lots of uh, good feedback and growth from here so thanks to you both and we'll look forward to everyone joining again for our next webinar which is probably going to be in about three weeks and you can watch for details on that as well and make sure you're connected with me on linkedin to learn about that so thanks guys Thank you. Bye. Have a Thank good weekend, you. everyone. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Bye.